in a certain way. And maybe you've been conditioned, maybe it was because of abuse in your own life, or maybe it was abuse of your own self. But it's amazing how conditioning works. Uh, the other thing that actually works against us is who we come from. <laughs> you know, maybe you come from a long line of dysfunctional people, or maybe you come from bro a long line of brilliant people, whatever it is. But you are the result, the sum and total of everybody who's ever walked before you. You carry their tendencies with you. Uh, I have a lot of tendencies like my mom. Uh, my sister has a lot of tendencies like my dad. And so on and so forth. That's the way it goes. Some of us have, not only do we have these tendencies, but now we have other propensities because of the world that we've lived in. How you were raised. The neighborhood you grew up in. The things that in the events and seasons of your life changed and transformed and molded you into an image. Now, the only thing uh, about that is it's hard to break free of someone who's, you know, it's hard to break free of a mentality that's been established over years. Are you with me? I mean, it's hard to break free of how you've been raised, how you've grown up, how you developed. It's hard to break free of it, especially if you're aware of the fact that some of the patterns, some of the thinking, some of the ways that you look at life aren't really healthy. And so you, you want to try to break free from toxic personalities or uh, places or even the toxic problems that flow up in your life and mine. You want to break free from that. But I want you to know that there is a very simple beginning. And sometimes we think it's the big things that we do that are going to make all the difference in the world. And I disagree with that. It's all the small, the little things that we do that will affect a dynamic change in your life. So before we head in, reading from Galatians chapter 5, let's pray. Father, I just pray that you would bless this, our Bible study. That you would open up our hearts and minds that we might receive a word from you. And so, for that, we thank you, we ask you, open up our hearts. Lord, bless this, our Bible study, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. So, we read in verse 16 of Galatians chapter 5, I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's almost as if we have just entered into a conversation. And you know what? We have. There are a bunch of people in the book of Galatians who are leaning on, doing all the right things in all the right ways, uh, being strict and stringent. It's kind of like uh, life at rehab. You have to do everything according to what you're told, and they would do it. They were perfect, and they found confidence in the fact that everything they did was just pretty much perfect. But, you know, that's the hard thing about being around a perfectionist. Have you ever been around a perfectionist? If there's anything a perfectionist doesn't want to hear is how they messed up. See, that's the problem. That's a lens that really can keep you in a bad place. You can be isolated from other people because nobody wants to hang out with you. Or you, you don't even like yourself when you mess up. So he says, his answer is, was, for people like this, he says, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In other words, there's two opposing forces that are going on in your life and mine. I want you to hear that again. There are constantly two opposing forces at work in your heart and in your mind. If you're a believer, well, the believer is like this. The believer, he, he kind of, she, she kind of comes to a place in their lives where they repent. They go, you know what? This isn't working. We call it a moment of clarity. Uh, maybe I'm not as smart as I thought I was. They come to that moment and they have that spiritual moment. They confess that reality. They repent it from it. They confess it. And then they bring it to the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus cleanses them and sets them on a path. And he says, now follow me. That's just the way it is. And so for most people, it's just, a, you know, a, I said a prayer and I, I live my life. But there's a lot more to be aware of. There's a lot 
to be really concerned about. And he goes into it. He goes into it in verse 17. He says, for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. In other words, there's a war happening right now in your life and in my life, in my mind, in my heart. There's a war going on right now. This isn't peacetime. It's kind of like they've always said, you know, crossing the Jordan, like when somebody dies, they cross the Jordan. But you know what? Um, I don't really like the phrase crossing the Jordan because when the children of Israel crossed the Jordan, they had nothing but battles from day one. And I think, I think this person who prays that prayer begins to factor Christ in the equation of their thinking. I think that's when the real battle begins. You, like the children of Israel of old, are taking your promised land. You're taking your promised land and you have to fight the Philistines and the Amalekites and all the other squatters that live there. And a lot of those squatters have everything to do with how you were raised, where you grew up, how you think, and the people you come from. So that war is a constant thing. It never ends. It's continual. That's how we can find people who are believers, who say they're believers, and we can find that they do hideous things. They can do horrible, evil things as believers. And that's because there's too many enemies in here, <laughs> too many enemies in here that will bring us to a place of defeat. So he says, there's a war. Now, by the way, the war between the spirit and the flesh is an ongoing battle. And I want you to keep in mind that both promise freedom, just so you know. I mean, it's important to know that your flesh promises you freedom. It says you should have the freedom to do this. You're free to do that. Come on, it's been so long. Why don't you give yourself a break? Have you ever heard that one in your head? Man, I've heard that one too many times that I can even count. Come on, man, you've been doing so well. Give yourself a break. You need a break. So why don't you just, yeah, just a little. That is the war between the spirit and the flesh. And so um, with the flesh, you have to fight. And that's why he says in verse 17, so that you do not do the things that you wish. I mean, how many of us? have been in a place where we've said, I need a break, and you head in that direction, and you really, really, really regret it later. And then you get up in the morning and you say, I will never do this again. Am I talking to anybody? You get up in the morning and you say, I'm done. Put a fork in me. I'll never do it again. And before you know it, you did it again. That's why he says in Romans chapter, I think it's chapter 7, he said, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, those are the things I do. It's the war that goes on in the mind of every reasonable believer who's breathing today. It's just, it's just a fact. And so he, he continues to write. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. In other words, he's saying there's a law at work to the flesh, it promises you freedom, but only delivers death. The, the promise of the spirit, spirit, spiritual flesh uh, is you get freedom and you get more freedom, but you don't get freedom from a battle, but you do get freedom from, well, from you. You get freedom from me. That's what I need. And this is where he goes on to define it. Verse 18, but, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, which are, now I'm going to pause here. The first four of these are all sexual in nature. He's talking about adultery, that's messing around on your wife or, or your husband or, you know, your friend's husband or wife or whatever. And then there's fornication, that's basically I can get together with whomever I want to get together with. Then it's uncleanness. And lewdness. Now that's where we dive into some real modern day Southern California erotic behavior. And that's where things get really out of control. 
But the one thing I wanted to say about this is that this is all about our sexuality and who we are. And so much, so many these days are putting so much stock on their sex or their desire for sex or whatever sex they, they would want to be. There's a big emphasis on that. And why do, they, why do they want that? And why do they scream about those who may not want to go down that road? Well, it's because they want the freedom to do what they want. But every form of living has its price. And I think that in, in much of this, you may not understand, but the truth of the matter is the very thing that promises you in the flesh, life will only deliver more drama, more frustration, more problems, medical problems, physical problems, social problems, psychological problems. It will just equal problems. And some people think that the bigger problem is they can't exercise their freedom. Oh, let them exercise their freedom and they'll begin to discover what real problems are. So the first four of these were sex. And by the way, I don't want to get involved in anybody's sex life. I'm not going to tell you who to sleep with, who not to sleep with, and, or anything like that. All I'm going to tell you is that God has a perfect prescription for your sex life. And he's given you that desire. He's opened it up to you. And he wants you, he wants you to enjoy that, but he has a specific plan. Now, your challenge is going to be to find it, to discover what God's plan for your life is. And when you do, it will set you free. Now we go on to attitudes, okay? First, spirituality. We've got idolatry and sorcery. That's in verse 20. Idolatry is, can come in all shapes and forms. Idolatry can be in the form of what you do at work. That's what I do. And your whole personality, your whole being is wrapped up in what you do and who you are at work. I'll never forget, I walked into a, a hospital and, and uh, because I've been a chaplain for the Oceanside Fire Department, I have a chaplain's badge. And it looks real official. I look like I'm from the FBI or something. And I go walking in with a Bible. I've got my badge and, and I'm walking through the door and everybody just, it's kind of like Moses at the Red Sea. It's kind of cool. Everybody just parts the way. It's kind of neat. And then they say, they'll say things like, thank you for your service. And I'm like, ah, I'm not a fireman. But I walked up to, I can't remember what floor it was at Palomar Hospital because we're going to go visit a guy. And uh, the head floor nurse, um, she was there at the door and she's like, she looks me up and down and says, what are you doing here? With her hands on her hips. And I say, well, uh, you know, I'm a chaplain. I, I, I'm coming to, to pray for a patient. And she says, not on this floor, young man. She said, I'm the floor nurse and that badge doesn't mean anything to me. Go back downstairs and get a visitor's pass. So you know what I did? I went back downstairs and got a visitor's pass because that girl is the floor nurse and just because I have a badge and can call myself a chaplain, it doesn't mean nothing to the floor nurse over at Palomar. Uh, you know, people who get wrapped up in their identity, could you imagine if I'd been just a little bit more full of myself? And she said, not here, sir. You get back down, I, excuse me. Hold up my badge. Do you realize who I'm... Now we've got all kinds of drama in our lives right then and there. That's idolatry. Idolatry can happen in the form of your car, your motorcycle, your dog. You can be idolatrous. We, in California, make an idol out of anything. We can make an idol out of aesthetic medicine. We can plump it, you know, prune it, pick it, pull it. We can do all kinds. We can make an idol out of our hair. It makes no, uh, surfing. We, can, we do everything out here. And we make, uh, we've got idols thicker than bugs on a bumper. That's just the way it is in Southern California. He says the attitude, that attitude, that, that just that spiritual spirituality to it. I know people who get on their surfboard and say, you know, I, I'm a very spiritual guy. I go out on my surfboard and I, I spend time with God. I'm surfing, but I'm close to creation and that's my spiritual, you know, rub. And so many people try spiritual this, spiritual that. I mean, now it's to the point where uh, as old as the Indians, we've got, 
we're saging everything. We burn the sage over everything and we're gonna clean it and make everything smell wonderful. Not, you know what, I actually like the smell of it, but at the same time, it, it just stinks everything. It's, it, it's not doing anything, but it's, a, it's an idolatrous, old, borrowed, spiritual thing. And then you have, that's why I'm, if you're sage in your house, you know, by all means. But anyway, then he says sorcery. Now, the interesting thing about that is that this was directly tied to uh, the things like shamans and witch doctors and those things. They always took peyote. They always ate mushrooms. They always did all kinds of things to have a spiritual experience. That word sorcery is where we get the word pharmacy. Pharmaki is the word in the Greek language in, to which this was written, written, written. but um, sorcery isn't just simply taking CBD and going to sleep. That's, that's not sorcery. Sorcery is not doing your chemotherapy. That's not sorcery. If you're a diabetic and you need to take insulin, that's not so sorcery. If it's prescribed by your physician, it's not sorcery. But if it's a means for you to open yourself up to the spiritual realm, now you're into sorcery. And that's a, it's a very destructive thing. There are doors that have been opened in your life and mine simply because we were under the influence at the time we wish we could have closed. That's why he's saying these are the works, these are the things, listen, these are the things that are at war with your freedom. Literally at war with your freedom. In other words, bondage to sex and, and your sexuality. Bondage to what you have or what you want or you know, what you love. It's anything that you love. It's sorcery, opening yourself up to the dark side. And then he says, uh, now he goes, excuse me, this is where he goes to our attitudes. And this is so crucial. Listen to this. He starts with hatred, contentions, jealousies. Do you see it? The, the attitude of of hatred, just having that negative sprinkle on everything, being able to hold on to your resentments, hating this, hating that, hating them, hating them. You know, that's a huge attitude problem for you and I. Hatred will consume us and destroy us. He goes on, hatred, contentions. You know, some people just love a good fight. Being in, in church ministry for so many years, do you know how many people wanted to come into the office, sit down with Pastor Howard, and just have a good old-fashioned argument for a while? And I, I, I've, I've, I've been in these debates where they suck you in. Have you ever been sucked into a debate where, like, I don't believe that, and why don't you believe that? And pretty, pretty soon it's a back and forth, and now you're just verbally fencing with somebody who will not be confused by the facts. That's contentions. Always looking, always picking, always seeing who's not working as hard as you are. Always seeing the problems with what the boss is deciding to do. Always seeing the problems with your kids and the things that they do constantly. That's contention. It's a life of fighting. Just a fighter. Jealousies. That's just honestly what it says. Wanting anything that anybody else has that you don't have. And being jealous over it. They get the promotion, you don't get the promotion. Oh, hey, I got engaged this week. You haven't been engaged, you've been praying for a partner for years. That's jealousy. It, it feeds on your flesh. Then he says, outburst of wrath. That's for the uh, actions. Now, remember this. Your attitudes always give birth to actions. They always do. How you think will inevitably play out on how you behave, your actions. Your actions will always betray what you're thinking. Just as much as your words betray what you're thinking, so do your actions. So he says, outbursts of wrath. That's the first action. Second action, you're selfish. Selfishness is a way to just self-destruct, to just keep it back for yourself, to not pour out. Do you realize how our lives open up when we finally 
put on a little selflessness and, and really give something away. I'll never forget, I was at a Bible study a couple of months ago and I was wearing some Uggs. I was wearing the Uggs into the Bible study and this big guy looked at me and he goes, hey, nice Uggs. Can I have them? I thought that was the weirdest thing I ever heard. I, I've never said, hey, boy, that's a really nice, those are really nice sunglasses. Can I have them? Never thought that. But here's a guy who's wanting everything he sees, even if it's on somebody else's body and it belongs to them. That's just flat selfishness. So many people just live for what they want rather than live. And remember this, life is not what you can draw out of it. Life, real life, is what you can pour into it, not what you can draw out of it. Further on, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, just constantly trying to push yourself beyond anybody else. Dissensions, that's just looking for the cracks in the... You ever watched any of the Housewives shows, guys? Have you ever seen any of them? Oh, my gosh. These women, my wife's got her hand up. These women have everything that anybody could ever want. Beautiful cars, beautiful clothes, beautiful husband, beautiful dog, beautiful kids, beautiful mansion. They have everything. And you can see a couple of them just walking around looking for an opportunity to let, let a little drama go off. Throw a little verbal grenade into the room. That's dissensions. Constantly, you know, causing dissensions. Now, dissensions isn't you calling out something that's wrong at work. That's not being dissentious. That's not even being contentious. But when you see something and you see something that's wrong, it's okay to call it out. It's okay to stand up for what is right. That's you doing battle, really doing battle against the flesh. I mean, you can go along with it or you can stand against it. It's up to you. But really, if you're standing against it, for instance, where I worked for a lot of years, guys just love to tell filthy jokes. They just enjoyed the, the filthy jokes. They'd, try to create new filthy jokes, find filthy jokes. But there was one thing they knew. Whenever they started with the opening line, which you knew was going to be filthy, I just immediately removed myself from the equation. I didn't stand there and preach at them because I, quite frankly, was the only one who was a believer at the time. So all I could do is just remove myself from the place because it's break time and they're having their conversation. And if they want to talk all that, they can do that. It's not my prerogative to straighten everybody out. I don't look for the dissensions in that way. But because of that, I have had a tendency to really get some intimate conversations with the very foul joke tellers because these things, because the war, they're losing. It's just like being ambitious, going after everything you, you want, ultimately, when you chase everything you want, you never, you never get enough. And it's the same way socially, personally. It's, it's, it, that's just how it works. Here we go. Selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies. These are all actions, by the way. Heresies. These actions just betray our attitude. And he says... Heresies. Now, heresy is an interesting one. Um, have you ever heard this phrase? Hey, all truth is God's truth. Have you ever heard that one before? Yeah, all truth is God's truth. Listen, that's somebody's way of elevating some other truth alongside the level of God's word. That's a heresy. That's taking any other truth and then marrying it to God's word. And the truth of the matter is there's, there's really only one truth and that's God's truth. That's why when we read these things and we unfold these things and, and reflect on these things on our lives, it kind of it brings things into focus. So he says heresies, envy, murders. That murders can even 
equal character assassinations where you wear that. I mean, and this, uh, this goes on every day in our world. Drunkenness, revelries, all I can say to you is one word, addictions. That's all this is. It's not necessarily the addiction, it's the acting on the addiction. In other words, drunkenness is a sin, but drinking alcohol is not a sin. But drinking two bottles of rosé before you go to bed might be considered a little sinful. Uh, there's so many other ways that we can express ourselves and find relief, and the least of which should be constantly partying, constantly drinking, constantly getting loaded, getting high, whatever it is. These things will lead you to bondage. They both promise freedom, remember what I told you, but they'll lead you to bondage, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And most people kind of rested on the fact that those who practice those things, and tell me if you felt this way too, those who practice such things aren't going to heaven. Is that what you've heard? No. Those who practice such things. So those who practice Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, sexual ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, and revelries, and the like, won't get to heaven. I'll tell you what, I've heard it in the affirm so many times in my life. If you're doing this, you realize that heaven is in jeopardy for you. Or if you've done this, you may not make... This is not what I believe the apostle is pressing here. Do you remember when uh, John the Baptist and Jesus said this? The kingdom of heaven is, is among you. The kingdom of heaven is in your midst. Jesus even said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, you can reach it. And what they were saying is God's kingdom has showed up. It's here. It's here, accessible, and Jesus was pointing the way. As a matter of fact, he was saying that when he died and rose again, he would put his spirit in us so that the kingdom of heaven begins to get established in our hearts. So what happens for too many people is they pray a prayer, but, and they've invited the Lord in, but they're still not having a kingdom life. And that's because when you cross the Jordan, you have a battle to wage. You have a war to wage. And yes, I, I've heard so many people say, I've asked the Lord to take this from me. Take my addiction from me. And I've, I've, I've actually met people who said, I prayed that prayer and guess what? I never wanted it again. And it's been decades. And they've never been to a meeting, but they've been free. But you know what? That has been the exception, not the rule in my life. I have met Many, many more people who have battled with so many. I just read a list and I've met people battling with five, six, seven, eight. All of them in different ways at different times. See, the thing that is missed here is the fact that Jesus would set up his kingdom in our lives, in our whole lives. He'd set up his kingdom for us. So the kingdom, we don't inherit the kingdom that's our inheritance, though. The kingdom is our inheritance. The king comes in and lives in us, and he brings everything he has at his disposal with him. And this is what he brings. And this is where we come to the end, folks. But the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is love. Now, that love is God's love for you. That's the fruit. Notice it's just a one word thing here, a fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love. That's the outflowing of God in you. Love. His love for you. That's, you know, 1 John. That's where he says it's not that we love God, but that he first loved us. That's, that's the main thing. That's where it starts. Next thing, joy. That's an absolute, overwhelming confidence. 
I, I remember watching the old movie, The Titanic. And uh, in the old movie, and I'm not talking about the more current movie, but they had one way back in the day. It was actually in black and white. I'll never forget watching it. And as the, the, the Titanic's going down, the, the band on the deck is playing a hymn, Nearer My God to Thee. And there's a, there's a rich guy who's dressed up like a woman, and he's trying to sneak on the boat, and he gets caught. And there's people trying to get on the boat because they know that if they stick with the ship, it's certain death. They're in the North Atlantic, it's cold. It's not long before they assume room temperature. By the way, the Titanic hit an iceberg. So as the boats are going down, this one very, you know, very stately gentleman and his young son, his son was probably 15, they walk mom and sister to the lifeboat and they kiss each other and hug each other goodbye. And as they stand on the deck and the boat's going down, they're waving, at, they're waving at their family with smiles on their faces because they had joy knowing that mom and sister were safe. And in that moment when I watched that movie, my heart kind of swelled because I discovered the value of joy in that moment. That even in the worst circumstance or situation, we know that God loves us. He's never going to forsake us. He's never going to leave us. And he's going to be with us every day. And even to the very last day, we can have joy knowing that our father gave his only son for us. We can have joy in the worst circumstances knowing that God is using all things together for the good, for those who are the called, who love God. So he says, the fruit of the Spirit. I, I'm looking at this like the fruits, you know, but it's the fruit. It's the one thing that happens. Love, joy, peace. Oh, to have some peace. When I rest in Him. When I, don't you agonize over a lot of things or am I the only one in the room? I mean, I agonize over all kinds of things. I have to fight my agony, agonizing over my agony. I mean, I, I got compound agony happening in my life, and it's so key to be able to turn to the Lord and let it go and just say, God, she's yours, they're yours, it's yours, this is yours, my sickness is yours, my depression is yours. I'm giving you all that I have, and he's willing to take it. Peace, peace. Long suffering. Now, you know, I'll translate it because I really looked this up. I, I want to understand it. It just means that you get to suffer a long time. Or then when Jesus is with you, you are able to suffer a long time. You are able to suffer in such, like the best description I can give to you from long suffering would be my mom in the midst of her chemotherapy. She was, she was a, a sponsor for many people. And she was always there for them. While she was in the midst of the chemotherapy, she was very, very sick. And she would be on the phone and people would be pouring their hearts out about the things, the tragedies that have gone on or that are going on in their lives. And I watched her one time just say, could you hold on for a second? Excuse me, just for a second, please. Is it okay? Yeah. She sets the phone down, walks into the bathroom and throws up into the toilet. Washes herself off comes back and goes, I'm so sorry. Thank you for waiting. Please continue. I mean, if I'm in the midst of chemotherapy and I'm puking my guts out, the last thing I'm thinking about at the time, I think, is to talk to somebody about their problems. I mean, as soon as somebody starts dumping on me about their problems, I'm going to say, you realize I'm in chemotherapy? You realize you think you got problems? Let me tell you problems. But this long-suffering is that quiet ability to honor the Lord even when, even when it hurts, even when it's hard. It's that ability to keep it closed when you want to open it up. It's that ability to sit down when you want to launch forward. It's that ability that'll challenge you every time you get behind the wheel of a car. We have a roundabout right down here. And I can't tell you how many times I come up to the roundabout and people are stopped there like it's a stop sign. You know, have you ever been there? You're like, 
Do, do you not realize where we are? You, they're, they're sitting there and they're looking, uh-oh, the road went circular, you know, and they're looking around as if, you know, there's something they should be doing. You know, and, 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 and Lucia has been an advocate for my long suffering in that she'll see my hand go up for the horn and she'll go, Howard, keep it down. <laughs> okay. There's a, that's a little long suffering. But you and I, that's another part of the fruit. It's part of the fruit of the Spirit. I mean, think about how many people we haven't suffered long for. How many people we get sick and tired of. How many situations we want to throw off and, and change. Oh, one of the fruit of the Spirit is long-suffering. I've heard so many people say fruits of the Spirit, but it's not fruits. This is one fruit. And it all comes in one package, by the way. So he goes on. Kindness. Kindness. Just simply being willing to be kind. The lady in front of you drops her magazine on the floor as you're in the grocery line at the grocery store. And you back up to let her pick it up. Kindness would reach down, grab it, and go, here you go, even if you don't want to. The guy's walking out of the grocery store, and he's putting his receipt in the basket or in his pocket. And as he keeps going, he drops a five on the, on the ground. Kindness goes, sir, sir, excuse me. You dropped a five. Lucia's amazing at this one. She'll, she'll order and buy like a few tomatoes and she put them on, you know, the thing and we went through it and when we went back, I think it was tomatoes, I can't remember exactly what fruit it was, it was tomato vegetable or something, we went back because she had looked at the receipt when we got home and it wasn't queued up on our receipt. So she went back and she said, I, I just you know, I, I wanted to give these back. You know, I, you gave me extra and, and you didn't charge me for it. And the checker looked at her like she was crazy. <laughs> like, why didn't you just keep going? Most people would just keep going. But she's a believer and that's a fruit of the Spirit. That's a evidence just as much as all those things that I read to you from the flesh betray your attitude so do these. They betray your attitude too. Kindness. Goodness. I mean, it's just being generally decent to people and decent to everybody you come in contact. And he goes on faithfulness. In other words, being a person that's good to his word, that can be counted on, that can be trusted. When you say you're going to do it, you do it. You're faithful. You know why you're faithful? Because God's so faithful. God's been faithful to you. And so he, he lays that out. Faithfulness. Gentleness. Being willing. Have you ever seen anyone have a gentle argument? I mean, it's very rare that you can see somebody keep their, their actions together, their words together, when they're extremely angry. Gentleness is a toughie, isn't it? These are all supernatural gifts, by the way. Goodness faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I, I once tweeted this. I said, the true test of freedom is not being able to do everything you want, but it's being able to not do what you want. That's freedom. That's self-control. That's the ability to drive past Krispy Kreme, not turn into the parking lot. It's so the ability, self-control would say, you know, I probably don't want to go to that store because that's the store where I usually purchase that which I shouldn't. Self-control will dictate your actions. That's what it is, self-control. And look what he ends with in that sentence in verse 23. Against such, there is no law. In other words, nobody can bring an accusation. And you are functioning in the manner to which you've been designed. And look what else he, he does. Now we go from kind of a singular mentality to now of a plural mentality. Verse 24. 
And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. They've used their faith to annihilate what they've been trained to think, to head in a completely new direction than how they were raised. I'll tell you what, I'm heading in a totally new direction than how I was raised. My wife is headed in a completely different direction than how she was raised, simply because we're walking in the Spirit and not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. And if we, verse 25, live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. If we live in the Spirit, we let the Spirit and the spiritual things lead us. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Notice how we bring in the one and others now. Why does he conclude with that? Because that's where the problems are, aren't they? The problems aren't with just me alone. The problems are with everybody I have to deal with or everybody who has to deal with me. Now I'm going to give you a visual here. How do you walk in the Spirit and not over the... Remember, we've got a war going on. There are battles going on. Your flesh, your desires, your uh, way of thinking, your mode of living has been patterned by a life that you've lived. And so how do you break free from that? How can I walk in the Spirit? Does that mean that I have to do all the right things and say all the right things and be the right person to walk around with love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kind? Do you realize that people walk around with this like a necklace and they, they allow that to be the, the means by which they're supposedly winning the war on the flesh? It's amazing, but if you push a button later, something always comes out. You can always see it. But I want you to know, the one thing that has always fascinated me is when we've flown. Um, my wife likes to pack, it, it, even if it's for a week, she'd like, she likes to pack like it's a Mars expedition. She, we, we pack everything, and she's got the bags out, and God bless her, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I, flight luggage for me was like either a backpack or a a bag that I got from the grocery store. You know, it's trailer park. But my wife, she's got class. And what she would do is lay out, she lays out all the bags and we've got outfits. Outfits with underwear and socks and we know what shoes we're going to wear. Okay, that's Monday. Now let's go to Tuesday. And, and she packs it all like that. And then we've got the toiletries. And so we get to the airport. I'll never forget this years ago. We get to the airport and I put the bag up there. Okay, that one's good. That one's only about 47 pounds. And I set it on there and they, they pull it back and then I, I get my other one on there. And uh, they say, oh, this one's 52 pounds. Uh, you're going to have to pay $180 to get this bag on because it's overweight. I'm, I'm sorry, is there any way you can take two pounds out of this bag? So there I am at the gate there I am at where the ticket counter is and I've got my bags open and I'm trying to hide the underwear. I'm trying to keep, you know, other things out of the way. I've got a boot, you know. Well, maybe the boot is a pound or two and then I've got to put the boot in my carry-on, in my backpack. And I'm grabbing everything I can, feeling embarrassed, trying to even out the weight load, okay? And so finally, I get the two pounds out of the bag, sew it up, they take it, and they put it on the belt. And I happened, as we get, finally get our tickets, I'm sweating, I turn over, and there's about two, three other people that are doing exactly the same thing. Now, this is my logic to it. I'm like, I took the two pounds out of my bag, now they're in the backpack, and we're all going to get on the plane. And you want to charge me 185 bucks to, to do that, but I'm, I'm still bringing the boots with me. So, you know, why charge me for that? It's just ironic. And now I'm in the flesh, okay? Now I'm completely and totally in the flesh. I might as well be committing adultery somewhere because I'm completely losing the battle of my brain and how I feel. Is anybody relating to me yet? 
Okay, so I get on the plane, and I'm thinking about all of these people who have overpacked for this flight. And I'm on this huge plane, and it dawns on me, when we get up around 30,000 feet, the steward comes out with the cart, and they've got coffee, soda, whatever you need, what can we get, what would you like, and you know, I'll have the peanuts and give me a cup of coffee or whatever, and, and they're serving, but yet we're traveling at over 300 miles an hour, probably more than that, at 30,000 feet, we're moving at breakneck speed across the continent, and they're serving drinks and beverages, and people are getting up to go to the restroom. And I'm thinking, this ginormous plane, and I'm sitting by the plane, the wings, and I can see the wings doing this. Does that ever stress you out like it does me? I'm thinking, I wonder how many flights this guy has had, you know? Is it one going to go flying off? I just, I watch that, you know? I just wonder. I wonder in my mind, you know? But, you know, this is the thing. The way that that plane gets up is called thrust combined with lift. It's got all that luggage, a bunch of fuel in it, a bunch of machinery, the plane's made of metal, but yet they're able with enough thrust. In other words, the air that passes under the underside of the wing passes faster than the air that goes over the curved overside of the wing. And the way that they're able to get that plane up is they get enough thrust to create lift. And so they have the thrust and the lift. And that's what gives a plane, that's aerodynamics. That's just basically an aerodynamics class from Dr. Howard. But, you know, (laughs) the point is this. If I'm walking in the spirit and I'm realizing that some of these desires that I have, to lash out, to maybe talk about somebody and enhance my dissatisfaction with them or enhance my, um, my disappointment in them or to enhance or to express my resentment. As I begin to do that, I don't realize, but I'm actually pulling thrust out of the engine. I'm actually taking the momentum that God wants to use in my life and I'm just letting the air out of it. See, God is willing to save and change each and every one of us and he's saying to each and every one of us, if we walk in the spirit, we will have lift. If we walk in the spirit, we will experience the fruit. Not the fruits, the fruit. It'll all come together. That's why in so many of these things, when we talk about works of the flesh, for so many people that have dealt with addiction issues, there's, there's a bunch of other ones in here that they're a part of as well. They're never alone. They're always a bunch. They're always in a cluster. And it's for you and I to start figuring out what's in our cluster. And then realizing it, become aware of it, spiritually aware of it and realizing that you are fighting against you. And get this, you are fighting against you and fighting against God at the same time. Have you ever been to an angry meeting? You know, an angry meeting? I have. The sponsor starts off and it's just a wife roast. It's just talking about the ex-wife and what a horrible woman she is. And then everybody starts to talk about all of these different, oh, well, you know, you think your wife was bad. My wife was this. And, and I'm, I'm listening to this meeting just going, I'm, I'm not getting anything here, but everybody's resentments. And, you know, is that supposed to be cathartic to get rid of those resentments? No. For the Christian, what they do is they bring out the resentments, but they don't bring out the resentments to express the resentments. They bring out the resentments to confess the resentments. To confess the fact that the very resentments that that we've been hanging on to have been hanging on to us. 
the very lust or the very desires, the very anger, the very outbursts of wrath, all of those jealousies, envies, murders, all of the drunkenness, all of those things hang on to us and bring us down and take the thrust out of us. And that's why he concludes with the plural pronouns. The plural pronouns, did you remember them? Those, we, one another, one another again, all in the matter of three verses. He's, he's saying that you and I, we walk in the Spirit together. You don't walk in the Spirit alone. You don't overcome any of those things that I read. I mean, some of you, maybe I said outbursts of wrath and you, you, you're an anger management kind of person. Well, you know, that's a place, this is the place where you bring that and you confess it and you, you let the air out of the flesh and you, you add thrust to the power of the spirit. Do you get it? That's where we are tonight, guys. There are things that we read tonight that resonated with you. You, you went, yeah, that's, that's kind of me right there. That's, that's one of the things I do. As a matter of fact, my dad did it before me, and I think my grandpa did it before my dad and probably my great-grandpa before that. Maybe you come from a long line of, and you fill in the blanks. The greatest way to change, to make the change, is little by little, every day as we change together. We get together in these meetings and we talk and we tell on ourselves and we confess it. We take it to the Lord. And then what does the Lord do? See, what you're doing by confessing it is you're putting it on a cross. You're crucifying it. I want you to remember what Jesus, what, what was spoken of Jesus. It says this, he who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. What we do in these meetings is we exchange our sin for his righteousness. And when we walk out, we walk out with just a little more thrust. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these words that kind of illustrate the battle that goes on inside of the hearts of all of us. We all have faced or tasted so many of these flesh works. But so, Father, we thank you that we don't need to be under the law because we're in the Spirit. But yet, the flesh cries out and we, we sometimes give in. But tonight, Lord, I pray that you would fill us with your Spirit, that we might walk in love, in joy, in peace, in the ability to long suffer, that we would be kind. Lord, that we would be right and good and faithful and gentle and in control at all times. We'd never lose it. And Lord, we thank you for those because the truth of it is we confess it and now it's crucified. So we give it to you tonight. Lord, take charge of our groups. Take charge of our time. In Jesus' name, amen.